Hello and welcome everyone to today's IMTS conference session, Optimized Advanced Manufacturing with Monte Carli Carlo Simulation. My name is Michelle Jacobson and I am the Assistant Editor of GIE Media's Manufacturing Group of Publications. Today's medical developments, today's motor vehicles, today's e-mobility and aerospace manufacturing and design. I'm excited to introduce your speaker, Naga Vela McCurry, Senior Mechanical Engineer at Kitagawa North Tech Inc. Naga is a Senior Mechanical Engineer with Kitagawa North Tech Inc. in the Custom Engineered Workholding Solutions Group. And prior to that, he was with Kenna Metal as a Design Engineer in the Homemaking Division. Since joining Kitagawa North Tech in 2016, he has been charged with the task to develop advanced and custom work holding solutions for automotive, marine, medical, and special machinery projects. Naga works closely with the design engineering, manufacturing, research, and development teams in the organization to develop engineered solutions and new products for the customers as needed. Naga has a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Clemson University and currently works out of Kitagawa's headquarters for the Americas, located in Schaumburg, Illinois. In his presentation, Naga will discuss the proposal to apply the statistical analysis techniques and focus on Monte Carlo simulations to improve the applications width and process efficiency in advanced manufacturing. Before we get started with the presentation, I want to remind everyone that there will be time for a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to submit any questions in the control panel at the right. We'll get to as many questions as possible. Now, I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to start today's discussion topic. Naga, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Hi all, uh, good afternoon, good evening to some of you. Um, today I'll be trying to discuss and open up the possibility of using Monte Carlo simulations in advanced manufacturing setups. Myself, Naga, I work with Kitagawa North Tech. Before I start the presentation, I would just uh, want to introduce myself I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Jawaharlal Nehru University back in India, upon which I started as a design engineer with Kenna Metal, finishing uh, my master's in mechanical engineering from Clemson. I'm currently working with Kitagawa as senior mechanical engineer. A little bit about the organization I work for. We belong to the Nippon Steel trading family under the Industrial Supply and Infrastructure Division. We are split into four major units. And uh, Kitagawa North Tech is a part of the machinery and the railway unit of Nippon Steel Trading. At this particular location, we specialize in custom engineered solutions for stationary and uh, rotational work holding. We are known for high performance work holding solutions for turning, milling, and grinding applications. And starting 2020, we wanted to enter more aggressively into the prismatic work holding business segment. The angle heads and heat strength tooling and special rotary table or the custom engineered rotary table solutions. We have been doing these solutions on and off in the past few years. But starting 2020, we want to grow aggressively in that business. So we have acquired a few sister companies and we have experts in those divisions working for us now. Starting right off with the presentation, I'll be starting to see why do we really need a simulation in any engineering case? What are the drawbacks if the simulation is not considered properly? How does a Monte Carlo simulation help us? And how can we apply Monte Carlo simulation with a process engineering setup? I'll be showing a case study on that. After that, I'll be moving to product engineering case study and I'll open it up for the questions. So starting off, uh, 
why do we really need to simulate any problem? The main need is because it's a risk-free environment. So if you are trying to simulate any machining problem in a computer, and if you are trying to aggressively machine it, you don't see the cutting tool flying out of your computer. So that is one main reason we like to simulate. It's a risk-free environment. It gives a better visualization. It helps to save resources like time, money, and the efforts of the people who are working on it. It increases the solution accuracy. It helps us to forecast precise system behavior. And it helps us to handle uncertainties. So in general, when you simulate any problem, the common predictions would be the base case. So when you're trying to introduce a new product into the market, you'll see what is the target amount it will be making, maybe $100,000 profit one year or 500,000. That is the base, base case. And it's a general trend to follow what is the best case and what is the worst case. So these are the normal uh, predictions that we'll be making out of any simulation, either with an engineering problem or a marketing problem or a new product introduction into the market. So these are the common predictions. So when we make any prediction, we normally don't consider the probability of that particular consideration. When we say we make a profit of $100,000 or $500,000, we don't really say that there is a 95% chance that we make that amount. So that is the main drawback of using simulations, um, not in a very particular way, but so once we start using the simulations in only a particular direction, the simulation becomes very subjective. And there is a chance that we'll be missing other desired possibilities from a simulation. So what Monte Carlo simulation does, it basically generates independent random draws for any probabilistic model. So it looks all fancy, but let's see how can we use Monte Carlo simulation with the small uh, video over here? So if you want to find the value of pi, we just, we just try to draw a circle and we just put a square around it and we start dropping random balls into the area So depending on the simulation, we can just see the probability of the number of balls which are landing within the circle divided by the total number of balls which are landing outside the circle in the square area. So by seeing these uh, ratios, we will be able to find the value of pi. So from this particular experiment, we see that it is a complete random experiment where we are just randomly dropping the balls and each is a very independent event and it follows a particular probability model. So trying to apply to a real-time situation, if we try to consider a new product which is being developed by a company, and the company wants to predict the first year profits for this product, the main factors which go into this consideration are the selling price, the first year advertising cost, the labor cost, the part cost, and the first year demand. And from that factors, we'll be able to find the profit with this particular formula. So one important consideration which we need to take into account is to find the distribution, the data distribution for each of these factors. So the data distribution might be any of the data standard statistical data distributions, which might be uniform, binomial, Poisson, exponential, or Bible. Uh, any of these distributions will be uh, normally attributed to any all the factors which we are considering in, in this particular example. So all the softwares which you are trying to use in this presentation are completely open source. Uh, so if you see this particular example, we consider the labor cost to be a discrete distribution, saying that there is a 10% chance that we'll be making uh, $31, $31 per 
uh, cost per unit for each of the unit, each of the uh, labor cost. Somewhere in between 10 to 30 percent will be landing up at 32 dollars. And for the part cost, if we are trying to take a block of steel, the upper price might be like 40 dollars, or the lower price might be 30 dollars. And uh, once we try to find the demand, so when we try to sell a new product, we'll be having a family of other products which are landing up in the same zone. So looking at that, we can forecast to see what is the mean distribution, uh, mean value for the distribution and standard uh, deviation, considering it to be a normal distribution. So this is what I was telling about the data distributions that we need to consider for each of the variable that we are considering. And uh, these are the estimated costs that are uh, uh, projected for having like $200 is the selling price of the unit. And maybe the adver advertising cost is around like $600,000. So once we have these parameters set, we see the profit is getting calculated every time. I have set up a simulation for 1,000 trials. I have uh, screwed it over here. It is showing 1,000 trials over here. And you see, every time we run a simulation, you will be seeing the change in the profit value. So you have so many simulations running, and by the end of the simulation, you will be seeing what is the possibility that you will be making a profit of less than $0. So there is only less than 1% chance that you'll be making a profit of less than $0. So this product, at a cost of $200 will not let the company into losses. So let's become a little greedy and start seeing how much more money can we make on this product by making $200,000 profit for the first year. So 94% chance there is a possibility that we'll be making a good profit. And this is how the Monte Carlo simulation basically works. It runs so many simulation conditions and gives us the possibility of seeing how much profit can we make from each product line or a new product line. So if you want to increase the selling price of the unit, so that immediately impacts on the profit margin. So there is an 86% chance that the company will be making more than $500,000 profit in the first year. So this is a very simple example where we have considered only a couple of or three parameters in general and the distributions were considered pretty straightforward in this example. So as we see, the Monte Carlo method considers the randomness in the behavior. It gives a very good probabilistic result. It shows a very graphical display as we have seen in the Excel sheet. It gives a scenario analysis. So it shows how many times are we able to make less than 500,000 or less than 100,000. So it gives a good scenario analysis of the entire problem. And it helps us to understand what is the relation between both our like multiple in input parameters that we are trying to give for a problem. So to just out what Monte Carlo simulation does is basically it has a transfer equation. In our case, it was the profit equation. The estimation of variation for all the input factors so we have considered three input factors and each one had a different distribution. So we need to estimate the variation included in each of the input variable. And what is the acceptable performance? So what is the profit margin that we were looking out in our problem? So if the profit margin is less than 100,000 or 500,000 is the acceptable performance. So when these three main variables are put together and when we solve a problem and the simulation complexity basically depends on the number of inputs, and the behavior of the input variable. So once we have all these put together, the Monte Carlo simulation is good to go and it will be helping us to give a good prediction of uh, the exact uh, performance that we are looking at at the outputs. So let's move ahead and see how can we apply Monte Carlo simulations in advanced manufacturing. Advanced manufacturing in general can be defined in three different uh, major industries like automation, process technology, and the computer technology. The companies are the business units which make a revenue somewhere in between like $10 million to $1 billion are termed out to be as the US middle market companies. 
So these are the companies which are aggressively trying to implement the advanced manufacturing in their facilities to improve the effectiveness of the solutions given. So the advanced manufacturing techniques like process automations or additive manufacturing or computer technology, which has been here for a long time, are the most commonly seen, but there are other techniques like high performance computing or sustainability techniques, which are pretty much of interest for most of the companies in the middle market zone. So trying to apply the Monte Carlo simulation in the advanced uh, manufacturing domain, I'll be showing a process engineering problem. The solution which you see here is an engineered solution that we have developed in-house. It has a hydraulic actuation and it's a precision advanced chuck. So this particular uh, chuck basically works by the hydraulic actuation which we have. And once we open up the jaws for loading the part, this would be called as a part loading feature where the jaws will be giving a clearance as we see in this particular picture. We'll be able to load the part in it. And once the part is loaded, the hydraulic actuation works and the jaws will be clamping on the part. So in general, when we are loading the part, the main uh, question we'll be having is how much clearance are we having on the uh, work holding equipment so that we don't interfere while we are loading and unloading the part. So from this particular view, we see that the part is pretty circular, but when you have a part with the flange in the bottom, like this case, the interference becomes very tricky. When you're doing a low volume manufacturing, it doesn't really matter. You can just put the part and make sure the interferences are clear and it works fine. But when we go for a high volume manufacturing problem, it would be mainly the robot which will be taking the workpiece and loading it onto the chuck. And the clamp and unclamp signals will be sent from the operation unit into the robot a control unit and the robot will automatically be helping the machine to unload and load the parts. So in this kinds of situation, when there is a problem with interference, it would be causing the entire operations to be delayed and the lead times would be increasing very much. So from the previous slide, we saw that any process automation would be basically having a sensor to sense the part. So it depends like what kind of sensor we need and what is the supply we will be giving to the sensor and the target behavior of the sensor. And what are the protocol standards, the machine interfaces, or the HMI access if needed for the machine? And what are the design considerations we would be needing for the process automation, like the target material or the environmental factors like the coolant or the chips clogging? And how much is the scaling accuracy that we need for this particular automation problem? So, so I mean, if you want to apply the Monte Carlo simulation to some kind of uh, automation problem like this, So similarly, I considered the nominal grip diameter to be 45 millimeters, and I have split the tolerance on the part into six standard deviations. Similarly, the hydraulic actuation is basically done with a piston. So the maximum coil position of the piston is considered, and the tolerance on the piston movement is given and split into again six standard deviations. Uh, the main reason I'm splitting into six standard deviations is because I'm considering them to be a normal distribution. So that is the probability distribution for this kind of problem. And even the workpiece dimensions are taken as a nominal and they are split into standard uh, six standard deviations. So once we have these values set up and I have set it up for running 500 simulations at once. So in general, we want to consider uh, what is the possibility that uh, we'll be seeing a clearance of less than 0.75 millimeters. So at this particular case, we'll be seeing uh, so many simulations run at once. So there is a possibility of seeing 
the interference like 20% of the time, somewhere in between 60 to 20% of the times uh, is the possibility. And the main uh, consideration here is we have only taken 500 simulations. So as you increase the number of simulations, we'll be getting more uh, accurate value for what we are looking at. So one thing which we can do is to increase, I mean, here we are considering only mainly three parameters. That is one consideration. But once you want to increase the accuracy of the solution, one thing which can be done immediately is to reduce the variation on the piston movement. So that, that gets it down to like 11% uh, failure chances. And if you want to still control the piston movement even further, it takes the failure chances even lower. So that's how basically we can work and see on the problems before we actually implement the solutions on the field. So this is one way of seeing how much interference we are having in any general automation problem. So here in this case, we have seen only like the automation for loading and unloading parts, but there are other automation uh, problems which we'll be seeing, but for helping with the automation which we have seen in the previous slide. The linear positioning system is one of the products which we are trying to promote for reducing the process times, improving the process efficiency, and using the product intelligence for optimizing the machining cycles. So what it basically does is the linear positioning system controls the position of the piston of the cylinder or the hydraulic actuation unit. So the more precise the linear positioning system works, the lesser will be the tolerance you'll be having on the hydraulic actuation unit and your clamp and unclamp signals will be given perfectly to the robot. And there will be very less chance that you'll be seeing the interference that is happening. So that is one way to solve a part loading unloading problem with the LPS units. also allow the robot to change the pallets for the work holding for as many parts as to be machined, allowing total unattended management of both part and work holding handling. The Kitagawa Automated Jaw Pallet System Special Chuck and Cylinder can be installed on one or both spindles, allowing the jaw pallets for the rough and finished part geometries to be changed. The robot loads the pallet gripper and inserts the jaw pallet into the chuck body where it is and there are um, automations which we have in place for changing the jaws automatically or changing the jaw pallet automatically or changing the chuck by itself completely where we can switch from an OD chuck to an ID chuck or from a three jaw to six jaw chuck. So this will be a complete automation when we have a family of parts which are running on any production unit. And this is more for uh, high volume production units so the main intention of having these automations and having them backed up with the Monte Carlo simulations would be helping us to see what is the possibility of having a very good result or what is the possibility that we'll be seeing an interference and how can we counter it before we actually install it on the field. So that's that with the process engineering uh, setup and coming to the product engineering problems. So what we see here are the specialized work holding solutions that have been provided by us. So the main issue when we move into rotational work holding problems are at the system level and at the machine level. At the system level, we have the cutting forces and the centrifugal forces because of the rotation. And at the machine level, we'll be having the power issues. The first part in the equation which we see here is the spindle rotation power which is needed and the second part is because of the torque of all the parts, all the mechanical parts which are involved uh, during the rotation process. So to understand more about the impact of mass, each of the part which is used in any rotational work holding problem will be having a moment of inertia. 
the individual moment of inertia will be joining together to give an equivalent system moment of inertia that will be adding up for the spindle drive and gives the equivalent inertia for the spindle drive which results in the higher torque which is needed for the acceleration of the spindle system and which increases the spindle power need at any operation so basically when we see what impact does heavier mass when it's rotating does for any machine is it increases the energy consumption that is needed for a spindle acceleration so as the increase of uh, power is done because of extra mass on the machine the time taken or the amount of power needed to move from a steady state to a spindle start state is very high so that is the main problem we'll be having when we are moving into rotational work holding zone so the main uh, problem we are trying to solve by using simulations over here is to cut down the mass or to cut down the rotational mass which is impacting the energy consumption of any spindle so that's the reason we moved into lightweight technology the structural index uh, was the main parameter that we have used to understand how can we use lightweight materials and from this particular graph we see the structural index of the carbon fiber reinforced polymers is comparatively high than that of steels or aluminums so we, there are multiple methods of using carbon fiber polymers we can buy a block of composite and start machining it but uh, we have tried multiple methods and we fixated about using the additive manufacturing techniques there are three major steps in any additive manufacturing process which is pre processing the printing and post processing in pre processing we have three variables the geometry the method of printing and the slicing in the printing we have the material selection the machine selection the process parameters and the environmental factors and in the post processing we have the separation technique and the heat treatment which is needed for the additively manufactured parts so we can use uh, the same uh, monte carlo simulations on the additive manufacturing problems and try to see what kind of parameters need to be set at what ranges to uh, give us a good result at the output so we have uh, tried to understand what exactly uh, how to use the composite and what exactly a composite is made of and uh, started off from at that point so basically a composite is made of a fiber and a matrix and there are different directions in which a matrix can be laid uh, i mean in, in in which the fiber can be laid it can be either longitudinal or it can be in the x axis or y axis or at 45 degrees the fiber orientation is in a very different direction in each of these laminates and all these three can be put together to be called as a lamina and one major understanding what which we have uh, reached from doing uh, simulations is that the fiber angle plays a very critical role in handling the stress in any operation so for a fiber which is at 0 degrees we have a deformation of 7 mm to the power of 4 for a 45 degree fiber at to a 90 degree fiber when you are applying a force in any direction the composite has a maximum load taking capacity in that same direction so for example if you are trying to apply a load in a zero degree or in x axis it will be having the maximum load bearing capacity in the x axis that's what we have tried to understand from the simulations and we try to confirm it with eigen value buckling so we see the profile to be different for a zero degree and a 45 degree fiber so from these uh, learnings we came into considering the strength of the ply is uh, basically a function of the fiber orientation and all the plies will not be failing at the same load and all the plies when they fail they fail and they result in the failure of the entire laminate so that's why it is called as a cumulative weakening failure model and in general all the laminates or the fibers 
will be following a viable distribution. So that is regarding the data distribution that we'll be needing to consider for any kind of a Monte Carlo simulation that would be done on the back end. So once we understood how the design works with the composite material versus any aluminum material, we try to compare and see the similar kind of material sizes over here. It is a 40 by 20 by five millimeter cube and we applied the same 50 kilonewton compressive force on both these bars which we see here. And uh, we see that the compressive force on a composite material is coming to be better because we have laid up uh, the composite fibers or the individual plies in such a direction. So this can be either done and this understanding can be reached from either simulating or doing the FEA analysis. So Monte Carlo simulation basically helps in this way where you can understand what kind of uh, orientation is needed in a particular direction. So we can reach the output which we are seeing on the screen here. So after reaching a conclusion where we understood the composite is performing better than the aluminum, we try to get a little more ambitious and try to see how are we comparing it with steel. So we try to get into the model analysis for composite versus steel. And we observed that we can run the composite parts at a higher speed before they reach their resonant frequency when you are using it on any spindle. So we try to implement all the results that we have seen from the analysis that we have done and try to implement in our product line. And we see that we can cut down the weight somewhere between 10.6% to approximately 50% for most of the products that we have been doing. So the first uh, product is basically a engineered solution which has been geometrically optimized and this one is a material optimization which has been done on this product. So we have cut down from a 480 grams weight to 60 grams weight on single part. So each assembly will be having somewhere between 50 to 100 parts. So we can imagine the amount of saving of weights we can be doing when we try to do the material optimization uh, by using these kind of simulations. Implementing all the simulation techniques, uh, we have a lightweight intelligent top tooling engineering product line, which has been patented. We are trying to implement it in as many as possible uh, ways into our product lines in daily use. The main intention is to reduce the cost that we are uh, uh, making the top tooling products with, the reduce, re reduction of the lead times, improvement in the efficiency levels of the top tooling performance, and use of the product intelligence for optimizing the machining cycles is being done with the lightweight product series. So we have done some field trials by using these lightweight products um, on the existing conventional machine setups. And we have uh, performed a cutting operation on it with a depth of cut of 2.2 millimeters, feed rate of 0.3 millimeter per revolution, a speed of 3000 RPM, and the production rate was like at 1700 pieces per week. And we have run it approximately for 10 weeks and we have seen the composite part was giving almost the same results what we have seen with the conventional steel part. So we were observing a parallelism between the top face and the loading face of about 10 microns. And the circularity was seen around like 15 microns on these parts. So the main intention of using all these simulations was to reduce the idle times, reduce the loss of grip forces, because the more uh, the mass you're having at rotation that will be increasing the centrifugal force that is involved in any rotation problem. So basically when you're trying to grip with a particular force of 50 newtons or 50 kilonewtons, the more the mass, it will be uh, reducing the amount of grip force that is involved in any cutting operation. So with lesser mass, the handling issues are also very low. And automation and the lightweight solutions together will be helping us to improve the productivity, the ease of use, and the efficiency of the solutions that will be used 
in any daily day to day machine tool operations thank you for listening so patiently uh, if any questions i'll be happy to take it all right naga thank you so much for going through that presentation and giving those examples and talking about the impact i do want to open it up to our q a session now so if anyone in the audience has questions you can still submit those in the q a box that's at the bottom of your control panel so to start off we do have a few questions so first naga how do we know what are the data distributions to follow? So depending on the type of variable that you are using in any kind of problem, so you have different types of inputs you need to take for a consideration of any problem. So each kind of input, depending on if it is a new product or an existing product line, you'll be having a data in the company. So we can be using those data to build the data structure or the data behavior of that particular input variable. But if it is a new product and we don't know how the data exactly behaves, so that's when people normally tend to go into the statistical techniques of going and finding, putting the data together and trying to see the goodness of fit or using your probability distributions to see how good the fit is with the different size statistical softwares like Minitab. So that's how basically people get it. And there is other way, which is more like contacting the experts in the field and taking the expert opinion on like multiple uh, multiple opinion from different experts and getting an average opinion of those expert opinions and try to see what is the data behavior we can be using for analyzing the inputs. Great, thank you. We also have a question here. What are the other areas we can implement Monte Carlo techniques? So we can use Monte Carlo. The way I have shown here is more about process engineering or product engineering. So there are other applications where we can be using the Monte Carlo techniques like in the ERP systems where we can couple the existing legacy data to the new software and try to forecast the existing product line. How much demand are we getting? How much inventory we need to make? How much product we need to manufacture every day? So these are the kind of estimations that we'll be getting when we try to implement Monte Carlo onto the ERP system. Or in case of a supply chain problem, like uh, if you are having an inventory coming from a different country, like in the current situation when your inventory is blocked out for one month or so, you need to put all these considerations or all these uh, different simulation values into your Monte Carlo simulation to exactly understand and handle the uncertainty that you might be having with the interruption of your supply chain. So those are two uh, applications which I can directly think of, but it can be used in even design design analysis where you can understand what kind of tolerance need to be given on each part to avoid interferences as we have seen for automation that can be stepped down a little into the design side and made a more applicable uh, performance for the SMD designs which will be done in house. All right, perfect. Thank you for explaining those other areas where it's suitable. Another question we have, why do we need a complex system like the automatic check change? So in general, normally what we do is uh, automate the production units when the volume, the production volume is really high. In low low volume production with high mix, we don't really need much of an automation. But when you go for a high volume production, we need to save seconds on the production lines. So that's where we go into automating completely. So one example which I have shown is where we have automated for the part placing and part clamping and unclamping and machining with the automation over there. But there are some other applications where a series of uh, family parts are used either for ID gripping or OD gripping. So there are applications where you want to change your chuck system completely at once so that you can swap between your parts and keep the production line running without much of an idle time on the machine. So in this kind of situation, when the chuck is replaced, you need the replacement to be perfect. 
you don't want any deflections happening in the replacement because that would be reflecting on your final part. So when the replacement happens, you need to be very careful of the possibility or the probability of seeing a failure in that kind of application. So that's where the automatic chuck change uh, implementation comes with Monte Carlo. And automatic chuck change basically finds an application when you have um, a multitude of parts which will be used for either ID gripping or OD gripping. And if you want to switch from an ID chuck to an OD chuck or a collet chuck, you want to have a system which is readily swappable and you can save a lot of time on the production times. All right, perfect, thank you. Let's see, were there any other questions anyone wanted to send in as we wrap up here? If not, we will go ahead and close. I just want to thank you again, Naga, for your insights this afternoon and for going through your presentation and examples. It was very insightful for the audience. And if the audience has any other questions, you can see that Naga also provided his contact information. So please reach out after and look out for this session to go online. And don't forget that we have more conferences coming up. So we look forward to seeing you in those upcoming sessions. So thanks so much everyone for attending and thank you Naga. Thank you.